And that was Mega Man Battle Network 6. I hope you enjoyed the video. Tune in next month and I review some stupid bullshit nobody will watch before accepting my fate and just making part two of the Zero video instead. Until next time, guys, I've been some fuck, and I hope you give me money to make more. Wow. I can't believe they even replaced me with Chris Pratt in the movie version. Well, here we are. Released in the U.S. June 13th, 2006, Mega Man Battle Network 6 is to date the final entry in this lovely little subseries we've been looking at. Continuing the version split idea, the game is divided into Psybeast Gregor and Psybeast Falzar, and unbelievably is the only Battle Network title I would recommend playing both versions of, as it manages to not feel like a lazy cash grab tactic this time. The versions are quite different, but we'll get there when we get there. Strangely, no DS version though this time, despite Battle Network 5 getting one, which is really weird. It's not like Battle Network 5 DS had that many changes or additions. It couldn't have been that hard, but I'm not a big fancy marketing man. What do I know, I guess? It's plain to see as soon as you start your first virus encounter or even load in past the intro cinematic that a huge amount of effort went into this send off. An entirely new setting, a largely brand new soundtrack, a new soul system, System, new chip selection system, an entirely new gimmick to replace the dark chip mechanic, tons of new sprites, hell, they redrew all of Mega Man's battle poses from the ground up, with a whopping 22 alternate sprite sets for the Blue Boy's various transformations across both versions. Regardless of how the game turns out, I would never say they didn't try to send off Battle Network with the respect it deserved. Or... Maybe I would, because that wasn't Capcom's original intention. Battle Network 6 was only turned into the final game during its development, which will become very clear later on. So they probably didn't know all this work was only going to be used once. I'm told apparently this was done to make way for some spin-off or something. You guys probably never heard of it. That's not important right now, though. What is important is that beautiful opening text box. Uh... We're thrust straight into the plot, joining 12-year-old operator and professional procrastinator Lan Hikari, alongside his bright blue brother-based net navigator Megaman.exe. Word around the school is that a kid is leaving ACDC town today, and Lan looks to know who it is. We already did this. Remember? Dex in Battle Network 3, the exact same plot point, even down to him not telling anybody about it to the last second. Like, sorry, as much as I'm invested in these characters, this is a little too sudden to hit home. It feels like the game wants this to be some kind of genuine gut punch, and the game just started two minutes ago. It's far too early for that. Of course, the reason this happened so early is to set up the story of this game, with Lan moving away to Cyber City, the cutting-edge net technology capital of the world which hasn't been mentioned in the five prior games at all. They say it's for Yuichiro's job, but he's been disappearing to faraway places for extended periods of time since, uh, forever. So I don't get why now is different. It's odd that this is their reason for moving away, as Battle Network 6 barely features Yuichiro at all, with him disappearing almost entirely by the second half of the story. You'd think his role would be expanded. Plus, previous games have shown that travel is so fast in the Battle Network universe that land can move across multiple continents in less than a day, and Cyber City is still in the same country. I know I'm spoiling the moment here and assigning plot significance to purely gameplay-based mechanics, but... Shut up, okay? Do you know how hard it is to come up with new things to say about this fucking franchise after five videos? The group say their melodramatic goodbyes and the Hikari family drive off to Central Town to begin their new life. 
for the next 20 hours until this decision is inevitably reverted. <sighs> new room and a new town. Finally away from that trouble magnet crap hole we used to live in. No more international terrorist cells. No more infected rampaging machinery. Just... Just kill me now and get it over with. Oh, six games in and there's still no option to skip the tutorial, huh? I'll be back in a second, guys. The girl thanks Lan and nervously walks off, and considering she has her own sprite, I'm sure that's the last we'll see of her. At home, Yuichiro has connected Lan's PC to the internet, and I draw your attention to this so I can explain the totally overcomplicated and asinine mail system Battle Network 6 has. Of every feature contained within this franchise, there's no part of me that thought the emails would become one of my most dissected topics. Yes, I'm gonna complain about this again. It just really bugs me. <laughs> The technologically advanced society of Battle Network has inconsistent rules for data transfer. Depending on what the plot dictates, either emails can be sent effortlessly and instantly from a PET or PC, or if the playtime is running short, navvies will have to manually take the file and courier it across the entire cyber world, and by navvies, I mean Mega Man. Mega Man has to. This has been amplified with a new mailbox prog that hangs out outside Lan's homepage. This prog is solely responsible for collecting Lan's emails from places outside of Cyber City's net security perimeter, as said security prevents his PET from receiving them. If this seems like a completely superfluous waste of time, that's because it is. I didn't even read the normal email, so you know I forgot to read these. With my nits thoroughly picked, we jump to the next day where Lang gets up for his first day at the Cyber Academy. Wow, this is still a lot safer than my old school somehow. Through the security bot speaker, we talk to our new homeroom teacher, the puffy-haired Giga-Chad, Joe Mock who invites us to the teacher's room to give us a school ID. Though on the way there, Lan and Mega Man spot a pale mannequin-like figure standing above the foyer that piques their interest. Oh boy, I can't wait to meet our new classmates. What sort of wacky fun characters will we meet in this new location? Oh, um, a literal toddler. Ooh, another tot. Some fucker. Another tot, and... Oh! Look at that scar! Oh, <laughs> he's so mad! Who's an edgy boy? This little fucking trash goblin is Mick, Kojiro Argaki in Japanese. If you can believe it, he's a worse version of Dex. But I'm getting ahead of myself. Our first class, hold your applause, is a busting lesson. But <laughs> they didn't account for the fact we've already done the virus tutorial. Jealous of Mega Man for... Uh, I don't even remember. Mick sabotages the test with a stronger virus, but, like, it's still a bottom-tier enemy. Should have done something like a mole. I heard he hates those. Mick doesn't seem too happy about being upstaged, and after being chewed out by the faculty for his reckless behavior, begins arguing with his Navi out in the hallway. Mick's Navi, by the way, is a featureless orange stock Navi whose only defining trait is that he looks pissed off all the time. He doesn't even have a name, he's just Mick's Navi. This is an aspect of the game that feels either rushed or cut for space reasons, more likely. We never even net battle Mick. There is concept art of him with a Navi mark, so I'd wager he was going to have his own Navi at some point, but it didn't make the final game. Custom Navi or not, doesn't matter for long, as the two have a huge fight that ends with Mix Navi leaving the PET. How did... is that a thing you can do? Wait, this creepo just showed up in the PET. Is that a thing you can do? 
Over in the classroom, Mr. Mock is introducing Lan to the pride of Cyber City, the technical marvel that is the copybot. Copybots are blank machines that are designed to house navvies and through hard light or some other science nonsense, recreate the navvies' physical form in the real world. To prevent the clear issues this would create, copybots cannot copy a navvy's weapon, cannot accept battle chips, and their strength is that of an average adult male. As we'll learn later, this is a bunch of bullshit. Lan immediately jumps the chance to see Mega Man in the real world, and Mach offers to let him try it. The brothers are clearly overjoyed to see each other face to face in a non-life-threatening situation anyway. It's very wholesome. Mr. Mock tries to defend his students, but is knocked unconscious. We won't hold that against him, though. I don't think Kung Fu works on robots. I'm gonna bleed you slow, you little shit. In our first of, unfortunately, few copybot sections, Mega Man uses the copybot's metallic body to simply walk past the flames, grab some water, and short out all the security. I hope that sounds fun to you, because that's about as in-depth as these copybot scenarios get. With the danger of a room full of burnt corpses avoided, our heroes then run off towards the teacher's room to find Mick, who was only being used by Blastman is completely in over his head, imagine that. The Academy Security Console is our final first Battle Network dungeon. It's even fire themed too, funny how that works. Though unlike the oven in Battle Network 1, the Security Console's gimmick is so benign that it might as well not even exist and isn't even really a gimmick. Blast Man is overheating the system and causing flames to streak across the cyber world. These deal damage to Mega Man unless he's hiding behind these metal boxes when the attack starts. A fine idea for an obstacle, but there's only three or four trigger points in the entire room and they don't re-trigger when you pass by them again, so they're a non-threat. I'm not gonna complain too much, we are at the start of the game, it's supposed to be easy. But I think six games in, we could ramp the difficulty up a little bit and just assume people have played at least a couple of the previous ones. Lan, help! I'm on flames! With Mega Man trapped, Lan yells for Mick to get his Navi, who's hiding in a nearby PC, to activate the sprinkler system, as Lan is getting increasingly impatient with the pair's bickering. They blame each other back and forth until Mick is suddenly set on fire by the burning console, and Mick's Navi hurries to turn on the extinguisher and save him. What a healthy relationship. With Mick and his Navi somewhat reunited, Mega Man is freed from the Inferno and rescues the remaining programs inside the Academy Comp. A nice touch I noticed on the way to the boss are these skull panels that denote where the enemy Navi is located, so you can be sure to heal up and save. A late addition, but a welcome one to be sure, and one that would be carried over into Star Force.
despite it all, Blastman.exe is, in fact, an opening Battle Network boss. So he's contractually obligated to heavily telegraph his moves as he shoots slowly in a straight line. You know how it is. His field is even marked with those same metal obstacles that block his attacks. So I'm gonna be giving him an even easier than Fireman out of 10. Ugh, I guess even in Cyber City, we're stopping fire-based catastrophes from burning everyone alive. I guess no matter where we go, the stench of criminal mischief follows close behind. Speaking of mischief, Mick comes up to us after school to do some sucking up and apologize in his own shitty way, and... Excuse me, can I help you? This is Tab, the son of the owners of the local game shop, who recklessly forces himself into being our friend, and he's pointless and dumb and I don't like him. It's like they purposefully gave Lan worse, less interesting friends, so you'd miss his old friends more. Tab's only personality trait is jerking Lan off in every conversation, and that gets old quick. As a sign of repentance, Mick gives us a map showing the location of a key that he hid on the net. A key that opens the path to the previously inaccessible Cyber Area 3. So just no one's done anything in Cyber Area 3 for the past couple days? I guess that wouldn't be that tragic, because as far as I can tell, Cyber Area 3 is home to a statue of two furries and the scenic Big Fucking Hole. The statue does catch the brothers' interest, though. According to the plaque, this spot is a memorial of sorts for Gregar and Falzar, two massive cyber beasts who nearly destroyed the net with their explosive rivalry. That massive pulsing gash in the ground is said to be their final resting place. Oh well, it's got nothing to do with me. We're just, just, um, completely out of ideas, huh? In a universe of famously dumb characters, the collective IQ drops to an all-time low in Battle Network 6 when Mick identifies the bird following him as a pigeon. Yes, it is unironically this meme. Nobody does anything about the situation because this is Battle Network, and the penguin is basically attached to Mick at this point. So the Hikari brothers are left to solve this problem on their own, because I guess we like Mick now. Now, children, let me put your fears to rest. I know you were scared that this game wouldn't have 20 minute long run back and forth across the planet and talk to random people filler fetch quests, but don't you worry your precious little ass. They haven't gone anywhere. We have to find food for the penguin and then figure out where it even came from in the first place. I'll save us both the time and the energy and skip ahead past this distraction that at one point has us jack into the bathroom to find tools for a repairman so he can remove an incredibly shallow small puddle of water so he can go to a bulletin board to confirm that indeed the macaroni penguin in the middle of Japan in fact came from the Cyber City Aquarium and is not a part of the local fauna. Like... Fucking duh, with where else could it have come from? It's oh why do you waste my time with these things, Battle Network? I love you! Why do you do this to me? Lan and Mick go to the Seaside Town Aquarium and it's closed, so we have to come back tomorrow. Lan wakes up the next day and receives an email containing a new version of the Navi customizer. Well, new isn't the most accurate word. The customizer is exactly the same as Battle Network 5, down to the tutorial itself being a copy-paste job. There's been one change that can make a big difference, but we won't have access to that feature for a long time, like the end of the game long. You can now place customizer programs hanging off of the grid, which opens up a lot of new possibilities for more upgrades. However, if any pieces are hanging off the customizer field, it causes bugs. So until we get bug stop, there ain't much we can do. And bug stop can't be obtained until the end of the game. You have to talk to the tip navi that runs the cafe in Central Area 1 a bunch of times, but only after a certain point in the story will he give you bug stop. Later that day at the aquarium, we find the director of the place, who informs us that the penguin, named Plata, must have run off because he was terrified of the resident animal trainer. A horrifying fusion of Wario and Waluigi, named Captain Blackbeard. That's... that's all you got for the pirate guy. Blackbeard. As thanks for returning Plata, the boys are given free admission to the aquarium, forcing Land to read every animal's exhibit before we can leave. I'm sure there's no special reason for that. Mm -hmm. 
right on cue. What did you incompetent troglodytes manage to fuck up this time? Looks like all the animals' enclosures have been hacked open, leaving them free to roam not only the park, but the entirety of Cyber City. Something about the water sources being connected? God knows why. Side note, I know I'm doing a lot of complaining, but I, I do actually like this game. It's just... I don't like the story very much. We'll, we'll get to positive stuff soon, I promise. Mick runs inside to protect the penguin, who he's formed a reluctant bond with over the past few days, while Land and Mega Man find a way to corral all the sea creatures back into their tanks. The director says that all of the animals are trained to respond to a feeding chime and return to their cages when they hear it. Does that sort of thing work on fish? Can you train them like that? And how do you send a chime through the water? Like, I understand sound travels, but not... Whatever, somehow a marine biologist will show up in the comments and get mad at me. While looking for a way into the announcement booth, Lan catches sight of the girl from a few days ago, calmly walking around the park. Calmly teleporting around the park. Stop for just a second, because I want to let you know something. Something that bothered me for most of the game. We'll get to know more about this girl character as the game goes on. Her name is Iris. But there will never be an explanation as to how she warped from behind this tank to the other tank. It's completely unexplained, so don't hurt your brain trying to figure it out like I did. Okay, back to the game. Iris walks out to the top of the entranceway and points off into the distance. We follow her directions and find a copy bot near the staff door. Oh, perfect. I know exactly what we can use this for. I have to get to the stage so everyone can see me. Ladies and gentlemen, your attention please. When we encounter Blackbeard next to the intercom, we have to hear about how he feels he's been wronged. It's not cruelty, he's only abusing the animals to get the best possible show out of them. The hardship toughens them up. We are literally at puppy kicking, levels of villain. All subtlety has crawled up into a ball and died. All the way back in the Battle Network 3 video, I mentioned that there was a dungeon I would always get stuck in as a kid. And, well, here we are. Three rooms of messy, random paths with three tanks each. You guide the blue boy to one of the progs stationed around the room, and it will offer some piece of information about itself. Then, bring it back to the tank with the correctly labeled marine life that matches the hint. If you guess wrong, it resets. Two sticking points here. First off, some of the hints are, well, battle network hints, so they're worded strangely or are overly vague. Problem number two is the process of moving said progs to the tank area in the first place. When you grab a green rabbit friend, shark fins will pop up and skim along the walkways, red ones that follow a set path, and blue ones that I think are supposed to track you, but they often just do whatever the fuck they want, and it makes things harder. My issue is, like the stealth sections in Battle Network 4, isometric games are not good for seeing what's ahead of you. So there will be moments of holding down sprint and running to avoid a shark, and accidentally slamming face first into a different one. <laughs> Didn't like this level. Oh, you cursed son of a bitch. That's gotta be hands down the worst verbal tick. There's no way there's a worse one. This guy constantly sounds like he's posting horny on main, the poor fool. Dive Man gets wrecked in seconds, so let's be brief. He's one of those bosses that's primary feature is that he's hard to hit. He fires off random missiles while darting around underwater, only popping up to launch mines, which is when you could strike him and oh, he's dead. Lamb plays the feeding chime, all the animals return, and Blackbeard is arrest arrested. Really? Wow, didn't see that coming. Though he did say something about an organization before he was dragged off. Hint, hint.
Lan wakes up from a strangely prophetic nightmare, which I'd comment on, but these are established to be a thing that happens to him regularly for some reason, so. Unfortunately, his magical foresight happened in the middle of class, so he's forced to stay late due to his untimely snoozing. As he finishes detention later, we get an email from the aquarium director with a new folder program attached as a thank you for everything we've done. the tag chip system. It's somewhat similar to the regular chip we're usually allowed to set, only instead of guaranteeing that a chip appears at the start of every net battle, it ensures that a pair of chips will always appear simultaneously. For example, when this roll chip randomly enters my folder select screen, it will now always be accompanied by this attack plus 10, and vice versa. As you can no doubt infer on your own, this in tandem with the regular chip marker makes program advances much more reliable than previous games. The folder itself also has a new building quirk added to this game that you possibly might not even notice. Rather than being limited to four of each normal battle chip, the amount you're allowed to equip is determined by that chip's file size. For example, if the battle chip's memory consumption is less than 20, you can load up five of them rather than four. So even more early game program advance fodder. But this does mean higher tier chips could easily be limited to three. This means very little during normal gameplay, but I imagine this heavily affects PvP. So we go to the teacher's room to hand in our after school work when a voice rings out from the hall. Oh dear, the fabric of space time has been shattered. I hate when it does that. Let's just move this over and. <clears throat> yep, that's a temporal anomaly, all right. Multiversion fracture, if I had to guess, usually caused by an unstable excess of corporate greed. We'll need to repair both branches of reality to quell the disturbance. Battle Network 6 continues the established formula from Battle Networks 4 and 5. Each version, Gregor or Falzar, has a separate array of navvies and operators that Mega Man and Lamb befriend. Normally, I wouldn't bother showing off both versions. In Mega Man 3, it means nothing, and in 5, it changes very little aside from a few lines of dialogue and which elements Mega Man can use. And Battle Network 4 is... Battle Network 4, I'm not playing that shit more than I have to, but earning new souls works entirely differently this go around, and actually results in a decent chunk of unique gameplay scenarios on each cartridge. Here on Gregor version, Mr. Match is the one who walks into the teacher's lounge, having come back from his quest to be the only person with real character growth in this series. Match wants to go straight and become a teacher, and chooses Lan as his first pupil, learning our boy real good on the true beauty of arson. And I do mean just Lan. Link Navi scenarios see Lan taking operating duties over his teacher's Navi, similar to Battle Network 5, kinda. While they all have their own special powers and traits, they don't gain Navi Cuss stat boost and their health only increases slowly and automatically as the story goes on, so they're a little fragile compared to old Rockman. For our test, we're given control of Heatman. Lan is challenged to defeat the Kettle viruses match released throughout the internet. The trick is that Kettles don't work like normal viruses. They have no HP and can only be killed when their temperature reaches 100 and they explode. The temp increases when they take damage, but is also constantly dropping. So what can Heatman do to crank up the heat? Being a hovering lighter with no legs, Heatman, expectedly, has both air shoes and float shoes. His charge shot, which doesn't seem to be named, shoots a wave of flames that consumes two rows ahead, and his special gold navi chip, Heat Press, slams into the opposing field and creates a plush-shaped fire pattern. Like their hit points, Link Navi's golden chips also increase in strength naturally with narrative progress. When the test is completed, Lan and Mega Man are then thrust into their final exam, having to defeat the current Link Navi in a net battle. I don't really have anything much to say about any of these. I'll be explaining how each Link Navi functions when controlled, and that's pretty much how their boss fight goes, so there's no need to delve into detail unless something really sticks out. The purpose of this fight, however, is important, as beating the teacher's Navi causes Mega Man's soul to resonate with them, unleashing our new cross powers. I say new, but it's just souls with a different name.
The cross system has Mega Man take on the attributes of his friends during combat, such as their busters and elemental affinities. Unlike Soul Unison, crossing doesn't eat an appropriately typed battle chip to activate, opting instead for a much simpler drop-down menu with no cost. Crosses also lack the turn limit imposed in prior titles, lasting until you cancel into another form or are struck by your weakness element. To facilitate this system, there is a new element square alongside the original that gives attributes to the more abstract elements. Wind is strong against Cursor, Cursor is strong against Break, Break is strong against Sword, and Sword is strong against Wind. In terms of design, the only difference is that Mega Man's legs never change during a cross. This is because for space reasons, the reason for a lot of jank in this franchise, all crosses are saved as overlays that are placed on top of Mega Man in each frame, instead of being a separate sprite sheet. So the devs saved on space by having the bottom half of Mega Man's body only swap palettes. Gregor version crosses, in general, are focused around beating the hell out of your opponents, while Falzar crosses mostly involve skills and utility attacks with lower damage. You'll get the idea as we go along. Heat Cross is a perfect starter cross, as it's a big dumb shooty shoot style. Your buster attack goes up by one, fire chips get a hefty buff, and fire arm is a pretty damn good charge shot this early on, as it has decent range and doubles your regular charge shot damage with an additional 30 on top. Back on the other end of the time split, who should walk into the teacher's room but... I've literally never seen this person before in my life. Remember in the previous videos how I explained that the second Battle Network trilogy has a sort of timeline split due to certain characters? This is one of those situations. We didn't play the game she originates from, so let me introduce you. Shuko Kido is the timid and clumsy operator of Aquaman.exe, Spoutman in English, and appeared in Battle Network 4 Blue Moon as one of the randomized tournament participants. She enters the City Battle Tournament as a way to try and earn enough money to keep her younger brothers, Atsu and Tai, in school after their parents died. Shuko joins the Cyber City Academy staff to once again earn cash to help her brothers. She asks Lan to assist her in setting up her curriculum, which revolves around using water to solve problems in the cyber world. As part of this class, Lan is given control of Aquaman and sent to the aquarium's homepage. While he does so, Shuko runs off without him noticing. She reveals that she actually has a part-time job there as well, since she's so desperate. And when we get to said homepage, Shuko has accidentally blown open the Nets water pump and flooded the entire seaside area. And we have her navy, so guess who has to mop up this fucking mess? All around seaside area, we use air currents to corral the fish back into their tanks. And once more, we have a fine addition to the it's a computer, why did you code it like this list. Aquaman gets shot upwards by the whirlpools, but can only be airborne for the duration of this meter. There's not a ton of strategy involved, mostly the fish just dart away in a linear direction until their pathing ends and you can grab them. Might as well break down Aquaman's combat while we work. His special chip, Drip Shower, is a bit finicky. The first few times I tried it, nothing happened. Aquaman teleports three panels forward and spins twice while letting out torrents of water. It's good, but it has to charge for a second, and if there's anything Aquaman occupying the necessary panel, the attack will cancel itself. His charge shot is like a bubbler chip, only chunky as hell, dealing decent damage, bursting backwards, and being so strong it breaks the floor tiles. I guess it was pronounced bubble lead this whole time. With all the fish rounded back up, Shuko still gets fired, duh, she almost destroyed the entire net. But as a result, she doubles down on becoming a teacher. Aqua Cross is also a great ability for the opening chapters of the game, offering a 5% heal when using water chips, sturdy footing on ice panels, and the fastest charging shot in the game out of the gate. Its elemental typing is a huge plus too, as it feels like half the viruses in the game are fire type anyway, so you get advantage over them. <laughs> On his way home, Lan notices a crowd in the park gathered around an eccentric woman who announces a compu-dancing jamboree, a special event in the cyber world taking place to promote the opening of the Cyber City Expo, said expo being the reason Lan's family moved in the first place. It's to be an event where every town in the region will show off their latest and greatest scientific achievements. Lan and Mick decide to go together to the pre-show to check it out, but when Lan wakes up the next day, Iris, of all people, visits his home, as she has something important to tell him.
yeah, cool story, Iris, but I'm getting a call from Mick right now, and... What is a fucking clown doing here? Iris was right, this place isn't safe. See? This is why you run at the first sight of a clown. I wish I was kidding when I say Clown Man gives the big suck and manages to absorb the Psybeast opposite of the version you've selected. The net police arrive on the scene, but we're six games in. If you think the police are ever gonna do jack shit, you haven't been paying attention. Yeah, yeah, that's about what I expected. Lan runs down to ask his dad how to handle the side beast, but Yuichiro forbids Lan from interacting with it, insisting that he let the adults handle this mess. Cause that always works out. The Hikari's usual brand of heroics are no match for a monster like this. Thinking his sons are out of earshot, Yuichiro ponders how to contain the side beasts, hypothesizing that they can be resealed, but an insane amount of memory storage would be required to hold them, far more than any single entity would be capable of. Dr. Hikari imagines the only way to contain them is if they had access to his memory expander, a program he developed 12 years ago in order to digitize Hub's soul into Mega Man. Actually, it's his work on that specific program that got him called to Cyber City in the first place. Hmm. After taking all this in, Mega Man insists on being jacked back into the computer. Even if they don't have a plan, he still wants to try and mitigate the damage in any way he can. When the Blue Bomber arrives, things have gotten even worse. Angry spirits have poured out from the chasm and taken over the region. Mega Man finds a wounded official who hands him a set of tools designed to destroy these sorts of creatures. A soul knife, soul sword, soul axe, and soul gun. There's only a limited number of uses for each, so they have to be used strategically. I get the vibe that the following section is a sort of replacement for liberation missions, or was at least inspired by them in some way. The three central areas are overrun with burning spirits wrecking up the place. Their color denotes their health. Blue, down to yellow, down to red. Each soul weapon does one damage step. The difference between them is their effective range. These ranges are important to account for, as striking a spirit in the back will instantly kill it regardless of color, while standing next to a spirit and not killing it will result in a retaliatory strike. Any extra weapons you have on you at the end of the area are converted into bug frags. Hold on guys, I know how to stop them. Knowing that they're outclassed by the monster, Lan prepares Mega Man for a safe ranged assault, but Mega Man refuses to back away.
While he isn't dead yet, Hub is still convulsing in pain as the side beast tries to break free. Lan is forced to watch with no way of helping his brother until he receives an out of the blue email from Iris, who is somehow aware of the situation, suggesting we head over to Seaside Area 3, where a special kind of healing water is being developed, hoping it will weaken the side beast inside Mega Man, and with no navy of his own able to get there, Lan enlists the help of Aquaman or Heat Man to clear the seaside area of spirits and retreat retrieve the water. This is a neat thing we'll be returning to a couple times. Any of our Link navvies can be controlled at almost any time, and this isn't the last point the story will require doing so. After cleaning up the spooks and reaching the fountain, the Link navvy gets an unfortunate eye full of Clown Man. Thank god we don't have to touch him, he just tosses out some viruses then fucks off. Uh, guys, I don't think this is an improvement. Oh, no battle, I guess. Mega Man is calmed down from his side beast rage, and after a night of land watching over him, Hub returns to normal. While the boys slept, their dad was able to examine Mega Man's ability to merge with the side beast's form, and program in a method for it to be controlled, making the best of a bad situation and all that. So, we have an angry demon inside of us. Cue the 2000s new metal. Battle Network 6's new marketing focus is the Beast Out system. Unleashing the fury of the Psy Beast trapped in his body, Mega Man's strength and speed greatly increase at the detriment of his mind. You can Beast Out by selecting the Gregar or Falzar icon on the chip selector. Once activated, Mega Man gains an assortment of new powers that differ depending on which version you're playing. G Beast Mega Man and F Beast Mega Man do share a few basic traits. Both forms give a 30 damage buff to non-elemental chips, and charging non-elemental chips will give you a wide-range claw attack, which lets you burn through weak chips or battle chips that have no use in your current situation while still dealing good damage. The other shared technique for both side beasts is this automatic lock-on cursor. If you have a chip-based attack, Mega Man will teleport into the optimal range for said chip before using it. The lock-on is the definition of a blessing and a curse. As far as I've learned, there's no way to turn it off, and no way to switch its target to a specific enemy. The teleport animation itself also takes a second, which isn't egregious, but with fast enemies where every split second matters, the auto lock will often miss, so you still have to be careful. On the distinctive side of Beast Out, G Beast gets the Gregar Buster, which fires lightning fast in a straight line, alongside inherent super armor so he never flinches. F Beast gets the Feather Shoot Buster, which while it doesn't pop off as quickly as the Gregar Buster, fires two short-ranged additional feathers in the adjacent rows. The biggest game changer though is Falzar's inherent buff, Float Shoes and Air Shoes. As I've said in the past, Float Shoes and Air Shoes are just too good in PvE. It essentially turns off the difficulty of various bosses and virus encounters, as you don't have to interact with the floor panels. No broken panels, no element panels, and no attacks that travel along the ground. Beast Out can even be stacked on top of crosses to create a cross beast form. While neither G Beast or F Beast Mega Man have a charge shot of their own, the chip charging claw attack turns into a brand and new move based around the cross's typing. Don't get too attached to all this new power though, as it's very limited. Mega Man can only beast out for three turns, with turns only replenishing one at a time when winning a battle without beast out, or leaving the cyber world and jacking back in, which is far more common. If this counter is depleted, Mega Man becomes exhausted and can no longer trigger full synchro. But wait, why is the beast out button still lit up? Thank you. 
if you're in a desperate situation and still need that extra edge, Mega Man can still transform when exhausted, but the trade-off is dire. Known as a beast over, Mega Man will force out one more turn of side beast energy, but entirely lose himself to it, being uncontrollable until the custom gauge refills. You'd best hope this kills whatever you're trying to kill, because you're fucked six ways from Sunday if it doesn't. When in this final emotional state, depleted, Mega Man will hemorrhage HP like there's no tomorrow, his buster goes to shit and he can't full synchro or transform. It goes without saying that Beast Over is exclusively a last resort. Mick bursts into the room. Thanks for knocking first. The clown that attacks Cyber Area 3 has returned to the scene of the crime, and so the brothers dash over to test their new power. He doesn't leave the back row. That's his gimmick. Also the fuck tent. I guess you could say he... got clowned on. A few days later on their way back from class, Mick and Lance bought a flyer advertising some kind of contest. The committee running the Cyber City Expo are planning to have a Navi inside a copy bot work as the tour guide for the event, and have set up a series of challenges- Oh god, here we go again, more fetch quest survival battles for fuck's sake, they just can't help themselves. Oh sweet, jury duty. Do any of you use your child arresting powers on, you know, criminals? Lan isn't allowed inside yet. He has to get a courthouse ID from Green Area 2 first, so we jack into the truth. Mosey over to the teleporter and then... So, well, there's new authorization. Lamb meets with the prosecutor for this case he'll be testifying in. Some guy named uh, Ito, and oh shit, folks, we got us a unique sprite alert. You know what that means. But uh, let's pretend I still have my innocence and I haven't noticed this trend before. This is some good ass popcorn. Prosecutor Ito introduces us to the judge who will be presiding over Blackbeard's trial. This fucking world deserves every single bad thing that's ever happened to it. The ultimate arbiter of justice in Cyber City is a cybernetically enhanced tree with a big gavel for a dick designed by Ito himself to bring justice to the world. I hate this universe so much. While examining the fuck tree, Lance somehow accidentally triggers another alarm and is rushed by security bots. Okay, so we all know who this guy is, right? He's an overconfident dick who knows who Lan is and is really good at popping in to save the day at the last possible second. He also has to be somebody we've met before or they wouldn't have bothered to design him with a disguise. Anyway, the case goes about as you would expect. Lan testifies against Blackbeard in an open and shut case of terrorism, but just as he's being pulled away, Blackbeard yells that this wasn't part of the deal, though he's hauled off before we hear any more. With Waluario put behind bars, we skip to class the following afternoon. Mr. Mock mentions that Yuichiro was at the school yesterday upgrading some equipment. What a strangely random detail. 
Oh, speaking of Land's Dad. So, Yuichiro is being tried for the crime of tampering with the judge tree. Something he obviously didn't do, because that would require him to do something other than sit in a room and bang out Mega Man upgrades, the thing he spends 90% of these games doing. They're gonna give him the chair in one hour if Lan can't prove his father's innocence. The Akari brothers go back to their school, remembering that their dad was working there yesterday. But when they flip through the security footage to get Yuichiro's alibi, they're ambushed by viruses and find that all the data from that time of the day specifically is missing. The prog who runs the camera offers to show us another suspicious clip it had saved from two days prior, in case it helps. The recording shows Mick bullying a security bot into a locker. A useless bit of information. That is, until Mr. Mock comes in to check on the robot, and mentions offhandedly that it records everything it sees, even through the vents of the locker, potentially. Immediately, Mega Man jacks into the security station, and sure enough, pulls up not only evidence of Yuichiro fixing the Blackboard's computer, but also video of the true culprit. Prosecutor Ito, dun dun dun. Lan runs back to Greentown to present his dad's alibi to the judge tree, but look who's here. Ito reveals himself as a member of the mysterious organization, and in one final crazy gamble, pronounces everybody in Cyber City guilty, causing all of the security robots in the city to attack the citizenry. The brothers manage to get away and sneak into the room beneath the judge tree, where they can jack in and shut the whole monstrosity down. Entering the judge comp, a voice calls out to Mega Man and questions his motives for fighting the organization. It's, it's World 3. There, I just made everything easier for us. Mega Man feels like he knows who the voice belongs to, but dismisses the idea as ridiculous and focuses on the task at hand. One advantage of text-only games, you can hide voices like this and it'll actually work. It's a lot stupider when they do it in games with voice acting. But what is our task at hand? Well, this is a courthouse, so we probably probably have to be a good Samaritan and respect private property laws. I'm only kind of joking. You've likely seen puzzles of this type before. When Hub steps on a dirt panel, grass pops up behind him, and according to the rules of the Judge Tree comp, it's illegal to trample on the grass. You have to navigate the area, pressing all of the gate switches without retracing your steps, or else you get and have to restart the entire room. On the easy side, but without a doubt the best dungeon so far, there's even real planning involved, as you can use the L button to look around and chart your path. The Hikari's reunion with their ex-leader, Colonel, is cut short as he's swiftly attacked by a navvy with a blade of some kind. I need to say this, I know there've got to be people who get mad at me for always doing this shtick with all of the series twists. The game is meant to be played by kids and young teenagers, so the story is simple. And I'm being a big, mean, nitpicky bully. I get it. But would it hurt to just have one not super obviously foreshadowed surprise over six games? So the unknown Navi manages to pull Colonel away from the area, leaving us to face down Ito's Navi, Judge Man. Judge Man is one of the simplest navvies to fight in the entire game, as he only has two attacks. He literally throws the book at you, or he cracks out a whip to hit you directly. We're a few hours in at this point, That that's it? What gives? Well, it turns out Judge Man is completely busted, as in his fight isn't finished. He is supposed to have a special gimmick in battle, but due to what is either a last second decision, or perhaps a coding problem they encountered, it never activates, even in his upgraded V2 and V3 forms. 
Big thanks to the cutting room floor and Griga Master for this footage that I'm too dumb to hack in myself. There are leftover files indicating a law and punishment system, where Judge Man would make it illegal for Mega Man to perform a specific action, and something bad would happen if the rule was broken. All that occurs when the move is hacked back in is the floor panels flashing blue, similar to the yellow flash that indicates an oncoming attack, then the game crashes. This would have tied well into the chapter's legal theme, but as I said, it was removed from the final game, making Judge Man lean hard towards basic bitch territory. Judge Man explodes, Ito is arrested, Green Town learns nothing and still uses the Judge Tree for some fucking reason, and the harmful status quo of the legal system is restored. Hooray? <sighs> what a long day. I could really go for one of those end of chapter villain cutaways with the menacing music right about now. Oh hey, here's one now. The worst Gurren Lagan character has a chat with recently assholified Beryl about the progress of their plan, which is still quite vague at this point, so not much information to be gained here. It probably has something to do with giant angry internet furries. Mostly, we just confirm that Beryl and Colonel are indeed working with the bad guys, but also that the people Beryl is working with don't seem to have much fondness for him. We cut back to Lan and Mega Man. Checking the weather, when everyone's favorite conflict starter, the mystical plot email, pops up to announce the second round of the Expo Navi tryouts being held in Skytown. Oh jeez, I don't know. If we're gonna beat those other navvies to win the contest, we're gonna need some training. I think I saw a seminar set up outside the courthouse, but can't recall what it was for. Over in Greentown, we meet Pat Ferran, a top-tier chef from the land that shall not be named, holding a cooking class, which will make less sense when you realize what we're going to be doing. Pat hands Lan her navvy, Slashman.exe, and sends him off to find and slice up imaginary cyber vegetables with the power of QuickTime events. The faster you input the buttons, the more of each ingredient you'll get. I happen to like quick time events, so I had no issues with this section, I quite enjoyed it. Those claws aren't just for slicing up carrots, though. Bring Slashman into battle, charge up your shot, and watch as he... throws kunai. I mean, it's not... it's not bad or anything, I just... I kinda thought... you know. Slashman doesn't use his claws to swipe at all when you play as him, come to think of it. Even his special chip, Rolling Slash, is a violent spinning attack, not a claw swing. He's still good, he's fine to play as, it's just a little confusing. Besting Pat in a net battle unlocks Slash Cross, possibly my favorite out of all ten crosses. Slash Cross Mega Man does actually get to use his claws for a charge shot. Said charge shot, Wide Slash, is just way too good. Damage-wise, you're looking at the usual, double charge shot strength, plus another 60. If you want to attack from afar, though, you can charge up sword chips to fire a sonic boom with that chip's range. Slash Beast's special attack is Slash X, a cross-shaped slice that does double damage if you're close to the opponent. Bottom line, Slicey Boy is very good. Master Fang Shen, help yourself to this informative post from Reaper explaining his goofy ass name, is the operator of Tanguman.exe and is instructing passerby on how to control the winds. Tanguman thinks he's too good for feet, so instead he flies around like a bird, which is fitting because you're about to have a very negative psychological reaction to birds. His charge shot is called Tangu Thrust. Ew. His unique battle chip is Fujin Tornado, likely the worst Navi-specific chip. It fires three tornadoes down the field, but each one only does 20 damage by default. A paltry amount, even this early in the adventure. The Master's Test revolves around collecting scrolls in each area while avoiding flocks of random birds flying in from off-screen that become more numerous as time goes on. If they get too close, you can use Tangu Man's limited ammo wind blade to scare them off for a moment. Okay, cool. Sounds like fun. Ah, oh, darn, I got caught. Well, I've already got half the scrolls, so it's not a- yeah, there we go. There's the infuriating part. This is my fault, I enjoyed that last test a little too much. 
I've broken this down numerous times, but anything that requires you to quickly react to something in this isometric camera angle quite simply doesn't work for most people. See Sonic 3D Blast. This is compounded by the fact that the birds are random, so often you'll have to use the wind blade to free up some space along these single square thick paths. And I swear, half the time I teleport, there's a crow right on top of it and oh, I'll just go fuck myself. Tangu Cross is nice though, makes up for it I guess. Air Shoes, always good. Charge Shot is a wide sword-esque fan swing that would have been better if it didn't launch enemies backwards. But they did think that through, and you can counter the pushback by pressing backwards and B, which pulls all of the enemies towards you. This same technique will also remove auras, though I never had a place to test it myself. Auras are exceedingly rare in Battle Network 6. I didn't even realize this was a power Tangu Cross had until after I finished the game because I do not read those style tutorial emails. All right, what kind of abhorrent ocean disaster is Skytown? All utilities in this world are some sort of giant terror monument that will nuke the whole state if an angry 20 something shoves their overpriced phone into it. Yo, where are the handrails? How many people have died falling from here? This isn't an artistic choice either, there are NPCs who acknowledge the lack of guardrails. We meet up with the rest of the contestants, and it turns out the next stage of the contest is a series of sir- Bye. Well... To start our test, we have to talk to Mr. Weather, the children's show mascot that runs the climate around here. Then we get sent off towards Sky Area for a te- Is that guy watching me? What is- uh, Oh god! Better focus on the task at hand. This is gonna be my final chance to break this down. So let me be clear as I can be, so you understand my position on these survival battle sections and why I think they're bad. Survival battles primarily bother me because, outside of certain post-game missions, they aren't challenging and don't reward you with anything. You don't get zenny or bug frags or upgrades or battle chips, and in a series where you will already be dealing with literal hundreds of random encounters, having gimped versions of random encounters with no drops, and having them treated as main quest content seems unneeded. If I at least still got the rank rewards, I don't think I would be so bitchy about them. I'm impressed Mick managed to even get this far considering he thought an old stove was an insurmountable challenge. Flawless comedic timing as always, Battle Network. Couldn't have done it better myself. Guess we're going to the Undernet now, which is becoming less and less secure with each installment, to the point where now it's laying open in a regular section of the net with a fancy archway leading into it. The Undernet is, um... Squares? I don't know about this one, guys. Aesthetically, it's passable, I guess, but layout-wise, the Battle Network 6 Undernet relies way too hard on these one-way arrow platforms. Yes, the Undernet has relied heavily on these in the past, but it feels like that's all this area has. The place is eager to use gunners and other enemies that lock down the field or stun you or force you to move in a certain way. So you get some frustrating layouts for sure, and in Battle Network 2 or something, this would be disastrous. But this is Battle Network 6. Crosses are free, chips are stupidly powerful, the Navi Cust allows for more upgrades than ever before, and you still have Beast Out if you really need it. I'm enjoying the game. Messing around with all the options available for combat keeps things from becoming a redundant chore. But Mega Man has so many attacks and abilities that you're really never in danger of dying unless you start really screwing around or playing recklessly. Except for the post-game stuff, obviously, but that's for another video.
We find Mix Navi dropped unconscious before a statue of Gregar and Falzar, ready to be sacrificed to the Psy Beast by a group of Undernet cultists. Despite their devotion to the damn Psy Beast, they somehow remain oblivious of the fact that they broke free days ago and therefore will not be around to accept any graceful donations you might offer. The cult attempts to sacrifice Mega Man to the Psy Beast, but you can imagine the problems with that plan. I need someone. I need someone to help Mega Man. Dingo! Oh, Dingo! Dingo, please help me. Mega Man, he's hurt and I... I don't want your fucking lessons! Fine, we'll go grab cute Spout Lad. He's never let me down. I complained a lot about traversing the net in the earlier Battle Network games, and net traversal being a process that they were very bad at in the beginning, but has slowly improved entry to entry. By the time we're here at Battle Network 6, not only are there multiple entry points to most cyber worlds and shortcuts to every area on Land's homepage, but Central Area 3 links to all of the other areas via a different path in each corner of the Cybe Square. These can be unlocked after getting a certain item from said locked area, like say a vacuum to suck up clouds. There are also stronger versions of these sealed pathways that can only be unblocked by certain link navvies, like removing a geyser with Aquaman. This makes it so that even getting from Land's computer all the way to the internet is far less torturous than, you know. Oh, for- he has a red- screw it. It's fucking windy out here. I knew they wouldn't be able to resist having the weather system catastrophically fail. Land rushes home and sees Haruko watching the news. As I said, the climate control computers in Skytown are bugged to hell and back, causing rapidly changing dangerous conditions. Maybe we can just hope a professional will fix it this time, but right before the broadcast cuts off, the brothers spot Iris up there. So being the good lads they are, we have to go check on her. Oh, this is not the time for a temporal break. God, time rips apart at the most inconvenient moments, you know? Okay, what do we have this time? On the Gregar side, Lan meets Anne Zapp outside the Skytown lift, trying to restore the good name of her prestigious family after her husband, Jack, joined an international criminal ring that was gonna blow up everyone with a satellite. Now operating a Lechman herself, she's gonna show our heroes how important electricity is in a society run entirely by computers. Our good time is derailed when Try and follow here. A gang of evil navvies drain the power from Skytown, and a Lechman is left to reboot the place. How does... It's a computer. Why does it get... dark? <sighs> a Lechman generates a field of light around himself, and is tasked with finding a sufficient amount of batteries to restore the power to Sky Area. Like, cyber batteries. Like, how does... How do things you find within the computer give the computer more pop? I don't... Alekman has his own limited amount of energy, and it drains if he's touched by the zombie navvy stalking around the place. You're kind of just forced to slowly inch along to make sure you don't get caught since you can't see anything. Uh, this test is okay. During virus battles, a Lechman floats, so extrapolate what that means for yourself. His gold chip is Dash Elexord. Again, use your imagination. And his charge shot calls down lightning on any enemies in the row in front of him, meaning it can hit multiple targets, but it's rather slow. Just like his overworld test, a Lechman is fine. While on the other hand, a Cross is... adequate. 
As you'd expect from an elect theme transformation, you can shoot a thunderbolt for a charge shot and not elemental chips can be charged for a paralyzing effect. This is definitely the most boring scenario. There are other ones I was more annoyed by, but at least I was feeling something. Over in Birdland, our confusingly Australian-named indigenous friend from Battle Network 5, Dingo and his Navi Tomahawk Man are trying to teach others to respect the Earth. He does this via net battling and a minigame. Of course, how else would he do it? Lan is tasked with controlling Tomahawk Man and chopping down four different sets of rising totem poles around Sky Area. When we find one, we're placed on the battle grid and given infinite charge shots to cut down a set number of totems without letting them fully emerge lest we be shocked. The dial the dialogue implies that Tomahawk Man's new eagle companion will assist us during the trials, but that just didn't happen for me, if it can happen at all. Playing these really makes me wish more of the challenges throughout Battle Network could have been neat little action minigames like this, instead of the beat X number of viruses X number of times. They're short bursts, not overstaying their welcome, they require a reasonable amount of strategy and concentration, and give you something fresh to do that isn't the same battling and walking around you were doing anyway. Playing as Tomahawkman.exe is nothing new for those who played the Team Colonel version of Battle Network 5. He's a wood type navvy whose charge shot is a devastating axe swing that. Oh, oh my god, it's so slow! I could chop down an actual tree waiting for this delay. This is a balancing thing, I'm sure, but oh boy, you gotta do some adjusting to hit with this. His special chip is Eagle Tomahawk, a powerful smash into the ground that both breaks panels and destroys battle chips the recipient is holding. When Mega Man battles against Tomahawk Man, he's quite a bit dumbed down from our previous encounter with him. His tricolored totem pole that granted three different buffs is replaced with an eagle with the uncanny ability to occasionally fly in a straight line. Before I even talk about Tomahawk Cross, I think something got mixed up here. Tomahawk Cross actually goes above Tengu Cross on the cross list, even though it's the third cross unlocked. Which I wouldn't think anything of, except for the fact that said order would have made way more sense. Tomahawk Man teaches us how to work with the Earth, so he should be in Greentown. And Tengu Man teaches us to control the wind, so he should be in Skytown. Other people have noticed this, right? I'm not crazy. Was this a development swap around? Because this really seems obvious. Surprisingly, they did bother to differentiate Tomahawk Soul and Tomahawk Cross. Visually, anyway. Utility is pretty much the same. Big fuck off chop, but the automatic grass panels have been removed for maybe balance reasons. Battle Network 6 doesn't give the impression of caring about OP shit, but we've discussed the problem with healing on grass panels before. Immortality and undershirt and such. It's also immune to status effects, which are a rare occurrence, but hey, free extra buffs are red. When the brothers approach the weather station, the director of Skytown curses Lan for trying to thwart his Villain of the Week plans. But he isn't a unique NPC, so something fishy is happening here, I know it. He activates these four elemental path blockers with no reasonable purpose or significance, with fake baddie McNaught the Villain hoping they'll occupy Mega Man long enough for him to finish his plan before somebody else appears. This isn't a dungeon. This is the generic PC room. Ugh. Padding. Man, they really should have just put the main dungeon out there. Hey, you! Design your RPG levels better. Ah, it's shitty Simone again, trying to steal Skytown's power supply for future World 3 maliciousness. Battle Network then insists on reminding me that being rated E continues to hold it back, as Lan Jackson within literal arm's reach of Vic, the grown man bent on global death and destruction who won't so much as shove Lan out of the way to stop him. Hope you like trying to form circles on a D-pad. That green goblin with the shitty cereal dropped his rainbow pieces all over the place, and Mega Man has to board floating cloud platforms to pick them up. When your colors are sufficiently saturated, the cloud will start emitting orbs. 
you need to find the storm systems and surround them with delicious orbs to quell them and restore the area's climate. Mr. Weather's comp doesn't really have a layout as all the rooms are open squares, and outside of the annoyingly specific way you have to loop to get the power to activate at times, there's nothing else really worth noting here. I don't know, come up with your own Skittles joke and pretend I said it. Sweet Jesus, it really is like all the bosses in this game are in a worse speech impediment contest. This one isn't even words. What is this AOL sign-in bullcrap? It was during this fight that I realized the only way I could learn anything about these bosses was to purposely dick around and walk in circles. As if I was actually trying, Mega Man stomps every one of them so hard that the fight would be over in less than 30 seconds. Now then, Element Man works exactly as his name implies. He switches between the four main elements, Fire, Aqua, Wood, and Elec, and has attacks tied to each one, in addition to tornadoes continuously spawning on the field. You don't even really need to take his element into account, as the Psy Beast is more than enough to plow through if you need a buff, without risking double elemental damage from using crosses. At the very least, he has more than two attacks, which is more than I can say for a lot of the other bosses we've fought so far. All right, who the fuck programmed the weather machine with grabby hands? There is no wholesome explanation for this. No weapons on copy bots, huh? I think somebody's full of shit. Yeah, well, that's what it's like being dead, Lan. Sorry. <laughs> no! Brother, please, stop! Oh shit, right, the whole city's gonna crash and everyone's gonna die. There's a backup system? Why doesn't it turn on automatically? What? Oh look, a bunch of fuck-ups. Hey, I didn't say it, Beryl did. Unable to trust these schlemiels with anything, the world's most handsome homeless man calls in Joe Mock to do the job right. Wait, Joe Mock? Holy bejesus, those mad lads did it! They wrote a plot twist that wasn't 100% super in your face obvious! They must have got my letters! What follows is five minutes of the pronoun game as everybody talks in vague, quoted words to discuss their plans. To sum it up, the idiots plan to betray World 3 almost exclusively because they don't like Beryl. At least that's what it seems like. While Beryl himself hands Dr. Wily the Force program from Skytown as they go on about their mysterious benefactor. Which I don't really give a shit about, but at least they're finally acknowledging the vast amount of money and resources it required to do any of this crap. Giant islands shaped like skulls don't pay for themselves. Back on the good side of Central Town, an official announces the final round of the Expo Host Contest. The first person to retrieve the Moonstone from the Undernet and bring it back will be crowned the winner. Hold up, from the Undernet? 
I was just joking earlier, but they really don't seem to give a shit about sending people to this place anymore, huh? But it's gonna be all right. Mayor Kane dragged his shady ass out here to wish us luck. I suppose I should talk about him now. He's such a pointless character, I forgot to tell you guys about him. Sharing a name with Dr. Kane from Mega Man X, but literally nothing else. Mayor Kane is the man Yuichiro is working for, and the reason we came out here in the first place. He can usually be seen snooting around along with his behooded bodyguard, whose identity is completely indecipherable with the clues we have now. Shucks, we'll just have to wait until later to learn the truth. Back to the Undernet. Oh, can we not? Can we just not? Can we not do the thing where you tell me to go to a place and it's locked and then I have to go to a bunch of other places to unlock the door to the original place I was gonna go in the first place? Are the 10 extra minutes of playtime really worth it? Hmm, Capcom? Was it worth it? Oh no, four heal navvies. What am I going to do? What is that, a fucking microwave duck? Oh god, it's this guy. Turns out his name is Mr. Press, an environmentalist and operator of recycling compactor dustman.exe. Oh, he's supposed to be dust man. That doesn't explain the duck lips, but I see the similarity, I guess. Hey, that means I get to use this literally. The pairs part ways, and Mega Man eventually does find the Moonstone along an invisible path in Undernet 2. Meeting back in the park, Mayor Kane congratulates the Hikari brothers for winning the Expo competition, making Mega Man the official tour guide of the event, even appearing on ads and commercials promoting said event. Also, Mayor Kane is the evil benefactor, but you probably knew that already. I bring up the commercials because it turns out Central City isn't the only region those Expo ads are airing, as Lan gets a call from Mail after seeing Mega Man on TV. The two chat and decide that the gang should meet up for the first time in weeks. But hold up, while I'm thrilled to see Dex again, we've got business here in Central first. After completing the Expo contest, the last two Link Navvies become available simultaneously. The person who saved us in the Undernet, as well as an entirely inconsequential fifth operator, whose class is also opened at the same time. It's pretty odd, and maybe feels like a rush decision for both of these Link Navvies to appear at the same time. Like a chapter was cut or something, so we're given two at once. I'll talk a little bit more about this in the conclusion. Let's choose one for the time being to try and keep things properly spaced out. At the school, in the room right next to where we got our first Link Navi from either Match or Shuko, is an exact copy of the same room, furthering my assertion that one of these Link bastards wasn't completely implemented for some reason. In Gregar, we respond to Dark Scythe's email, promoting a class about improving net battle techniques. Surprise! It's actually about murder. Dark Scythe is an apprentice of an assassin who we should be familiar with. That's right, he's training under Dark Person whose English name is still undecided. We're gonna take his Navi and do some sneaky killing around the Undernet to pass Scythe's test. His Navi being the demonic Eraseman.exe. He's called Killer Man in the Japanese version, and this is one localization change I can get behind. I'm sure Killer Man sounds fine in Japanese, but to me, in English, it sounds laughably edgy. Ugh, my Navi is Kill Man. <laughs> So Lan takes my immortal man to the undernet, where we have to sneak up on various targets and assassinate them. If you get close without them noticing, they'll go down instantly. But if you're caught in their crosshairs, you'll have to complete a virus battle instead. Truly a harrowing punishment. It's a hundred times better than the sneaking mission in Red Sun, because these targets are stationary and have clear indicators for where they're looking, so you don't get caught from off screen. But how's Mr. Killer on the whole killing side of things? His charge attack is a slow wide sword that skips a space, and his gold chip is an eyeball laser. Erase Cross, on the other hand, is great. Erase Man's killer death beam chip becomes Rock's charge shot. It pierces through anything in its path, even damaging otherwise invulnerable enemies. And plus, there's one other little quirk that I think is neat. I'm sure a lot of you are familiar with the whole four equals death thing in Japanese. The word for four is she, which sounds the same as the word for death. 
So if you hit a virus with a four in their HP, they are insta-deleted. This doesn't work on navvies for clear reasons, but they will instead incur an HP bug that essentially poisons them. It's a cool gimmick, I like it. Here in Falzar version, we instead meet Moliarty. A pun on Moriarty? Like the Sherlock Holmes antagonist? But a mole. You know what? I've been dissecting these stupid names for two years now. I give up. Fuck these names. I don't care. Everyone just tells me I'm wrong anyway. And this guy's fixing to teach us how to drill stuff. Inspired setups, guys. Moliarty's navi is groundman.exe, who I call the drill man for this entire segment and didn't realize till I was done scripting that that isn't what his name is. Moliarty wants land to appreciate mining. No thanks, I'm good. And so asks us to destroy an avalanche of boulders that he purposefully put there in a set time limit. Groundman's power fluctuates between four levels, and you have to time your A press at the strength you need. There are progs all around the area who don't seem too concerned about being trapped by boulders, and are more worried about stopping to yell at you if you hit them with the drill, which wastes your time rather than, like, grinding them into fucking paste. This challenge is strict. Likely the strictest extra challenge of the ten. Even when I feel like I'm on a good pace, I still pass by the skin of my teeth. And even then, the game still occasionally decides that I lose. Granted, this might be the result of the input lag introduced by my completely legal and legitimate Game Boy Advance. Drillman himself is a tank, kind of literally, and as a tank, he has super armor and shrugs off most attacks from viruses. His charge shot, Drill Attacker, fires, wait for it, three drills. His special chip launches him forward with super armor and deals like 40 damage. I think you have to intentionally miss and slam into the back row to shake down some rocks. Maybe if these chip descriptions were made up of more than five words, it would be easier to discern their effects. For Mega Man, Ground Cross gives super armor, which gives... Dear God, I'm so sick of explaining all these things. Are you sick of hearing me talk about them? Why did I do both versions? What am I, fucking stupid? The charge shot sends Mega Man tunneling under the ground, then he'll pop up in front of the nearest opponent and scramble their insides. You can charge up a brake chip to cause an avalanche of boulders, but I don't ever use brake chips, so... Wade rides over to his hometown and meets up with Male, Dex, and Yai, while Mega Man finds Roll, Gutsman, and Glide in the Cyber World. It doesn't take long to locate them all, as ACDC area has been reduced to a single room, which makes sense as we won't be here long, why waste the memory? Of course, Dex and Gutsman want to net battle Lan and Mega Man, even though Mega has a literal demon inside of him, but that's not gonna stop Battle Network from making me fight Gutsman, goddammit! Oh, thank goodness. They have got to be trolling me at this point. Gutsman and Glide have been shown to be two of the top eight net battlers in Natopia during the N1 Grand Prix, and Roll and Gutsman both demonstrated the same during the Red Sun Tournament. They can't handle these two fucking goobers. They don't even try, they just sit there. Even once we get to the internet to save them, they're still just standing there. Yeah, that was real hard, guys. Thanks. Well, guys, just stand there, please. Thank you. Man, don't do anything. Team Rocket, now with Mega Man Psybeast in their possession, prepare their plan to betray Beryl and Wily by. Why well, don't actually know what their plan is or how having this side beast is going to help them get the other side beast? Whatever it is, Mach is out. He's done entertaining these doofus's hijinks. Lan returns home to regroup and come up with a strategy, but, well, it's Lan. Oh, good, I almost had to think. Mick calls Lan in a panic and asks if Mega Man is with him. 
When Lan responds, uh, no, Mick warns him that a Navi-controlled copy bot that looks an awful lot like Mega Man's Psybeast form is rampaging around Seaside area. Oh, look, Mega Man is losing his mind. Again. And Lan tries to talk him down. Again. Do I sound bored of this? It's because I'm bored of this. This used to work for me, seriously. I used to be actually emotionally affected by these sorts of scenes, but we've done this Mega Man, listen to my voice scene at least seven or eight times since Battle Network 4, and it's lost all effect on me. I'd be more moved by a stiff breeze. With perfect Proto Man esque timing, Iris shows up, and she's somehow able to temporarily tame the Psy Beast, but it runs off into the cyber world before Lan can get through to him. Mayor Kane suddenly arrives to vilify Mega Man and accuse Lan of cheating throughout the contest, which sparks a furious reaction from the boy, but that bodyguard kid stops us from doing anything about it. I like the implication that Lan was just gonna beat the shit out of this old man. Unsure of where his brother's gone, Lan gets an email from Mr. Mock telling us he's got some super important info in Skytown. So what's the deal, Sensei? Oh, you're part of World 3? Yeah, I, I knew that. The game really should have waited until now to reveal that surprise, so it would have had more weight. Kinda knocks the wind out of the plot's sails when we learned Mach was evil five hours ago. But I do appreciate his following interaction with Lan. Thanks to Mach, we now know that Mega Man has retreated to the underground, that pulsing vortex of doom that's taken up most of Cyber Area 3, the place where the side beasts were locked away before Clown Town set them free. Lan takes control of one of his friend's navvies and sets off to find Hub in the underground, and it's locked. The only person in town who has permission to clear the barrier for the chasm is unfortunately Mayor Kane, and we aren't on great terms right now. Lan tries to enter the mayor's office at the school, but it's being blocked by security. Frustrated, he explains to Mick how he lost Mega Man with no way to get him back. And hearing his predicament, Mick offers Lan a way to distract all the security bots in the school and clear the doorway. By breaking the monitors in the foyer, Mick immediately summons a swarm of security to his location. Oh no, they did it. They made me like him. In the mayor's office, wha- oh no, other shock noises. Mayor Kane is the bad guy? Lan can hardly believe this stunning revelation. And like a good little shonen antagonist, Mayor Kane explains the history of the Psybeasts before capturing us. Back in the early days of the internet, a large mass of bugs accumulated and merged together into a new being. Psybeast Gregor. The fact that Gregor is also an amalgamation of bug data explains why Gospel from Battle Network 2 looked so similar to it. To delete this monster, a scientist spent months creating an all-powerful program, eventually leading to the birth of Psybeast Falzar. But predictably, Falzar was too strong and dangerous to control, and the Psybeasts battled each other with reckless abandon, destroying the cyber world in the process. The godlike creatures only stopped by the net inhabitants managing to trap them in the underground, where they were sealed for a time. Following this disaster, the scientist who created Falzar was shunned from society because, yeah, he really pulled the two giant paint bubbles on us. And in retaliation, that scientist's grandson swore revenge on the world. That grandson is Mayor Kane.
Still doesn't make me give a shit about him, and I still think he's a pointless character, but hey, more lore for the lore gods, I suppose. Aha! It's Q! I knew it! The mayor and Blackbeard are carted off, while Eugene explains to Lan that he's been secretly watching for Kane's ties to World 3 this entire time, hence his disguise as the mayor's bodyguard. He has a few more things to take care of, but manages to open up the underground for us first, and promises to send in Proto Man to help when he's finished. Wow, it's so... Pink. Like just the undernet, but pink. To get through this place, we're gonna need to do some more soul reaping. I'm glad to see this gimmick return, it's a good time. Strange how infrequently it shows up, but I'd rather that than it being overplayed. Psybeast, Mega Man, G, and F. Our first version exclusive fight that isn't an optional link, Navi. Both forms are pretty quick, but Gregar gave me a lot more trouble when it came to just landing hits. They both act in much the same way, using their respective busters and a few of the elemental beast cross attacks, even though Mega Man suddenly doesn't have to charge or consume chips to use them. I actually think it's a really interesting idea to be put on the opposite side of the Psybeast's power, to see what a pain it is for other Navis to deal with it. Mother fucking clowns. Oh, Proto Man, buddy, I'm glad you're here, but Eugene already told me you can drop the anime cloak thing. Mega Man calls out Colonel's I'm too cool for school bullshit, noticing that he could have easily deleted the exhausted Link Navi if he wanted to, but he didn't. Angry and cornered, Colonel lashes out and forces Mega Man to defend himself.
Colonel suddenly decided he wants more attacks than Battle Network 5, so now he's got him. Colonel Cannon has been upgraded to a giant friggin' rocket launcher with homing missiles, and he must have complained to the people who created Colonel Soul because Colonel Army no longer requires raw transmutation materials. Now they just pop out of the goddamn dirt. He makes himself supremely vulnerable when he does this, though, so feel free to throw corn in his face or something when he's just standing there. To summarize, Lan and Mega Man are trying to ask Colonel if he's acting this way because it's what he truly wants in his heart, or some outside force is clouding his judgment. Barrel gets salty about this and pulls the Ethernet cable in retaliation. Stop talking to me like I like you, Tab. You waste of carbon. So those murder bots outside, those are just for harassing kids, right? Because they've yet to stop anybody else from coming in. The trio of paint sniffers barge into the classroom to force Lan to telling them where Iris is so they can kidnap her, as they know Iris and Colonel are connected, and they really fucking hate Beryl for being moderately more competent than they are. Haha, <laughs> yes, finally! Six games, baby! Finally happened! Like clockwork, Iris appears in the back of the class and gives herself up to save Lan and his... friend. The security bots surround Iris, but she nonchalantly tells them to screw off and they listen. It isn't explained how yet, but you're gonna be really mad when I tell you. This whole kidnapping business sounds like a serious problem that we should solve as soon as possible. There's only five areas to search in the real world. They're pretty small, we should be able to find them. Ho oh, ho, that's not good. Even if you know where those dorks have taken Iris, you have to go back down to the end of the Undernet to read the forum and discover their location that way. If you go to the spot before then, there's no one there and nothing happens, so don't ask. I'm not going to spoil anything yet, but there is some class A plot fuckery required for the characters to have gotten into this situation. Sweet last minute character development. After saving us, Mach dumps two backstories for the price of one. Mr. Mach originally joined World 3 because Dr. Wily forked out the cash for a prohibitively expensive surgery to heal his daughter. The illness isn't specified, but it's a child and this is Battle Network, so it's probably a heart condition. Now that would have been fine, but the writer decided that wasn't enough motivation. So Mach also tacks on his history with Beryl, with Mach being a martial arts champion seeking out new challengers, until he met Beryl who knocked him on his ass. Because of spirits or honor or some such, this instilled a great sense of respect and friendship between the two, and Mach became Beryl's student. Having sufficiently unloaded all that emotional baggage he was carrying, Mr. Mach now has the room to pick up Beryl and drag him back to Wily. As with a lot of events in this game, Lan just kinda stands around and watches as it happens.
Next day, Iris is back. She's at school. She's mysterious. We don't actually get any answers. Yeah, I, I, I get it. Lan and friends hear that despite the world-ending threat of World 3 and the Psy Beast, the Central City Expo will still be progressing as planned. Even Lan questions this decision, so you know it's a bad idea. But then he gets a special early invite to said expo, and all that caution evaporates because God forbid this moron learns anything. It even says he gets to invite as many of his friends as he wants. Oh, golly gee. Well, thanks. All right, the day has come. The Central City Expo has opened. <clears throat> <clears throat> <clears throat> Sorry, my throat's kind of dry. Let me go get a drink real quick. I'll be right back, guys. <sighs> Fuck. Is that a train with a face? I must be seeing things. What was in that vending machine? They're all fucking disgusting. Why was that even in there? Well, let's power through these alcohol-based delusions and cover some more Link Navi scenarios. So in Gregar version, we receive the tutelage of Al Ferry, the guy who saves us from the cultists in this timeline instead of Dustman, and a conductor who's holding lessons about trains and yeah, sure, why not? We operate his Navi, Thomas the Tank EXE, and chug around the net to pick up passengers and bust them about their busy lives. Unbelievably, this is far more interesting than it sounds. Charge Man's minigame is a fast-paced reaction test as you tear down the train tracks and dodge incoming obstacles, or smash through them with a charge shot when you're looking stuck. Just a fun, fresh minigame. I'd say it's my favorite of the bunch, honestly. Playing a charge man in battle isn't bad either. He has fire body, which tanks flame attacks. His charge shot, Crazy Locomotive, is a super armor dash that is good, but you shouldn't be too overzealous with it. I had to learn that lesson the hard way. And his special chip, Volcanic Charge, puffs out chunks of burning coal to smash enemies. After we defeat him in a net battle, Charge Cross works much the same, retaining the super armor charge dash. But Mega Man gets an extra passive ability. Every turn that passes while in charge cross, an additional chip gets added to the selection menu, up to eight, similar to the effects of the custom plus navi parts. I guess the idea is that you're getting freight delivered more chips? To top it all off, Charge Beast Power, Charge Bite, whips a decapitated Gregar head out for over a hundred damage, and is so ungodly weird and terrifying that it freezes all the viruses on the field out of fear. All things considered, I can't believe I walked away from Choo Choo Man with such a positive impression. You know, I'm gonna brush past the fact that this publicly accessible vending machine links to the dark web because I have other things to complain about. As stated earlier, Nightmare Face is Mr. Press, a man obsessed with recycling and preservation who wants to spread the good word of Recycle Bin far and wide, which is why his partner is Dustman.exe, a Navi who has absolutely no effect on real world pollution whatsoever. Though he's not doing much better in the cyber world to be honest. Dust Chunk is slow as fuck. His gold chip, Dust Break, yanks in an enemy and smashes them for 110 damage. 110 damage, you say? That's a big number, isn't it? Sure, kind of, not really. We're at the end game now. No viruses have under 100 HP, usually closer to 200. Why is this a problem? Well, both of Dustman's attacks have long delays on the end, way too long. It's barely a second, but that's huge in a game like this. So I don't like using Dust Break because it's too weak to kill 90% of the enemies you'd use it on in one hit. And even if it does, you'll be locked in place and hit by someone else. He does have super armor, but that doesn't matter because because his durability isn't high enough to compensate for leaving himself open, because every Link Navi, remember, has the exact same health. So Aquaman and Dustman have the same survivability. He's built like a tank without the actual tankiness part. He's still usable, but he's not any more so than any other character. I don't know if this is a hot take or not. I explained the combat quirks first this time so you can see how hilariously fitting I found it that Dustman's minigame revolves around him sucking garbage. You smash the bombs while shoveling trash into your face hole. What can I say? It's serviceable, it's an action-based minigame, so I automatically enjoy it more just for the variety. After smashing Duck Lips, we earn Dust Cross, who has the bonus skill of sucking up objects and spitting them out for crazy damage. But unless you place them yourself somehow, maybe 5% of all encounters in the game have rocks and such that you could inhale. So a nice extra to have, but very much an edge case. 
Much more useful is Trash Shoot. Come to think of it, it's actually just the add function from Battle Network 2 and 3. The key difference being that you trade the old chips for new ones instantly, rather than waiting a turn. And last up, the Charge Shot. If you watch my content and streams, you might have heard me use the phrase Trash Goblin and similar insults. It turns out that Dustman and Dust Cross's charge attack is a literal Trash Goblin. It's like it was meant to be. Ah, perfect. The balance has been restored. That's every cross from both versions. I did it! As tedious as it was to cover all 10 of them, I still think the system was a great idea. All of the special minigames and events are genuinely where most of the game's variety comes from. Outside of the cross scenarios, the game plays it annoyingly safe. The main dungeons are okay at best, and the story is definitely words in a sequence. So it sure is great that all these varied side quests are entirely optional. Yep. Other than Heatman or Aquaman, you don't have to unlock any of the Link Navvies. This is why all of the Link Navi missions are sequestered off into side areas and have no plots assigned to them, and why you can choose which ally to use whenever Mega Man is missing. While I always appreciate more options, this has the negative side effect of cranking the plot pacing down to zero when you have to keep stopping for 40 minutes to get these new powers in unrelated adventures. I know this seems like exactly what I've been asking for complaining about the side content all this time, but this is not the way to do it. If you don't stop to do the cross quest, then you're not only missing a ton of the depth of the battle system, but also the majority of Battle Network 6's interesting overworld activities. As a result, the main plot feels very low stakes and messy since you keep diverging from it for extended periods of time. Oh, right, the main plot. On the day of the preview gala, Lan invites all of his friends, and also Tab, to come see the expo early with him. We get the smallest bit of character interaction when the two friend groups meet each other, but nothing groundbreaking. They all get along immediately with no questions. Well, let's go visit the expo, which is in no way, shape, or form a trap by Dr. Wily. I keep bringing it up because seriously, they know that the expo was designed by Kane and World 3. This is the weakest excuse for a final confrontation so far. Wily's plan would have completely fallen apart if the Hikari brothers just didn't show up. Somebody would have noticed when the expo opened to the public, or Kane would have ratted him out. It, fuck it, who cares? We're almost done. Here at the Central City Science Expo, there's a wide array of pavilions for your perusing pleasure. Like the whale that got his front teeth knocked in, or the sun that's giving you the bird. Huh, an entire hall filled with copy bots. Hey, have you guys ever read Full Metal Alchemist? No reason. Yeah, no fucking shit. All of Land's pals are taken away, and he's left alone with heel navvies bearing down on him. I sure hope somebody in red comes to save me at the last minute. Hey Eugene, why did we come to the one place they always look for us?
It sure is nice having a friendly character who's good at actual physical violence. Mock tells Lan and Eugene about a secret path to the Expo Pavilion, before charging back out to fight off the copybots. Eugene stays behind to stall them as well, leaving Lan and Mega Man to sneak into the Expo alone. For the love of Christ, can you three fuck right off? All of the expo buildings have been tampered with, and Mega Man has to head inside to fix them so we can progress. Ah, son of a. It's a callback, John. It's a reference to the first battle network. Yeah, I know, I still don't care. And all of that work was for nothing, as after we break through all of Ito, Yukia, and Vic's traps, everyone is surrounded by Wily's copybots. As the two Psy Beasts call out to each other, the Hikari brothers realize that if Gregar and Falzar were to battle once more, it would be far too dangerous for the others to be involved. They couldn't even handle Dive Man. <laughs> so Lan and Mega Man head in to face Wily one last time on their own. One more last-minute villain exposition dump. I'm gonna be sad to see it go. Let's start by learning what Iris's deal is, and by extension, Colonel. Colonel and Iris were both part of a project by Dr. Wily to create the ultimate Net Navi, a Navi with an unparalleled tactical mind, dominion over all weaponry, and a kind heart. The completed Navi, Colonel.exe, was given to Beryl when he was young. But why would the comically evil Dr. Wily give some random kid the strongest Navi in the world? Well, the same reason Wily is so pissed about Beryl's sudden side -switch. Switching. Because Dr. Wily raised Beryl. That's right, they reused Dr. Regal's plot twist from the last game. Beryl was the son of a soldier who had befriended Dr. Wily, and Beryl was left in his care when that soldier went off to war. He died, as you'd suspect, and as a result, Dr. Wily, with this tragedy stacked on top of all his other rejections and failures, returned to his hateful ways, splitting away Colonel's kindness and control programs, forming them into Iris, and using her to manage his myriad of evil weapons. As a spiteful last resort, Wily coded the pair so that if they ever attempted to recombine, the resulting Navi would be instantly deleted. Hold up for a minute, that's interesting and everything, but w what did you say? Iris is a weapons control program? So if that's how she stopped the security back at the school, why did she turn herself in? Why didn't she just use the robots to stop Ito, Yukia, and Vic? All three could have been arrested right there. Wait, if Iris is a Navi and a copybot, how was she knocked unconscious to be taken in the first place? She's a robot. How did they even manage to take her anywhere when she could have just jacked out into any piece of technology they passed along the way? There's even a PC right next to the pier where the cutscene takes place. Don't say it was to keep her identity a secret, because even if they didn't know Iris was a Navi, if she was indeed meant to be unconscious, which is the only way that scene can happen because she would have just jacked out otherwise, they would have had to drag her around and noticed, oh wait, this little girl weighs 300 pounds. That's weird. And on that note, the good doctor sends Iris in to control the Psy Beast opposite of Mega Man's.
2,500. Half of the post-game bosses don't have that much HP. We're gonna have to make liberal use of cross abilities and beast out to tear these two down. Gregar is up first, and he's shockingly gimmick-free, despite being one of the possible final bosses. Thank you again. He fights by firing off his own versions of Mega Man's Cross Beast charge attacks, most of which have quite the range on them. His attacks by themselves aren't really the issue, the real headache comes from his speed. Gregar is either warping around the arena or attacking you, he has next to no downtime. So you can either counter him on a predictable attack, or use your own chips and skills with a wide range to strike him while he's busy. I had some trouble with him, but that was mostly my own impatience and an audience of 200 people breathing down my neck. Ugh, we have to talk about Falzar now. He's ostensibly the same as Gregar, with most of his attacks made up of various Beast Cross specials. But, as you can see, there is no field on Falzar's side of the arena. So, as usual, a large portion of the chip library simply doesn't work. But, since he has no grid, that means the grid doesn't apply to him? No? No, it does. You just can't see it. No other way to put it. This is fucking dumb. How am I meant to judge perspective like this? You have to try your best to discern which of the nine panels his head is on, as it's the only part of him that takes damage, and while he's not as squirrely as Gregar, he is still constantly teleporting around and firing a million projectiles at you. You could just wait around all day to counter him for a guaranteed hit, but... God, that's boring. The worst part is that I actually had an easier time with him than Gregar. I missed half of my attacks and still managed to beat him on my first and only attempt. So it's not that they made Falzar too hard, it's that he's a goddamn asshole who isn't fun to fight. I imagine his post-game Omega variant must be absolute hell. The Psy Beast, drained of its power from the battle, retreats back inside of Mega Man, who himself is completely exhausted and unable to fight back. Entirely possessed by Gregor or Falzar, Hub sets his sights on Colonel and Iris. Another climactic confrontation, another world-ending plot foiled, another non-lethal explosion, the beauty of Mega Man Battle Network. 
Lan tries one last time to convince Dr. Wily to drop this I hate humanity grudge he's been holding onto for decades and just accept the punishment for his actions. Hearing Lan's words, that humanity isn't something you can simply cast aside, and it's never too late to try and atone for your sins, even if you'll never be forgiven and frankly don't deserve to be. For the first time we've seen, Wily wonders if things could be different, but laments that it's far too late to go back on everything now. Maybe a step kill will be easier to convince. Barrel? Time passes. The surviving members of World 3 are captured for their crimes, even Dr. Wily himself, who was found beneath the rubble of his lab. Regretting the path he had taken in life, over the coming years he would begin to work on a special pair of cooperating systems to make up for all the destruction he caused. A hunting program named Colonel that seeks out and erases viruses and aberrant data, while its companion program, Iris, regenerates and fixes damaged areas of the cyber world. Ito, Yukio, and Vic were all found and imprisoned, of course, but none of the officials tasked with searching the area found any remaining trace of Beryl among the wreckage. We join the cast in their classroom in ACDC town. Even the Central kids are here since their school was right next to the expo that was nuked out of existence. All the kids officially graduate and are congratulated by Miss Mari and the Giga Chat himself, Mr. Mock who was given a lighter sentence for being cooperative, and also considering his reasons for aiding World 3 in the first place. Lan and all of his friends meet outside of his home, having moved back from Cyber City as that whole expo ordeal turned out to be a dangerous hoax. The gang discusses where they want to go in life, and promise to stay connected even if they go their separate ways. But Lan has one more surprise to unveil before everyone splits up. A scruffy looking man in a long coat left something for him, and he has somebody he wants everyone to meet. So, Mega Man Battle Network 6. I thought it was pretty good. The combat side of things is better than it's ever been. The lack of restrictions on crosses and the additional layer of the Psybeast powers, alongside the infinitely more customizable Navicust. The game also learns a lot from past mistakes during the overworld RPG sections, frequently turning off random encounters to let you focus on puzzles and challenges, while making said puzzles and challenges far more engaging than go to place and fight thing, or go to place and use item. There's even more new aspects I didn't even mention, like the virus battle or the quest board, but those are gonna have to wait until we cover the post game. But all of that's not to say the game is perfect. It's got a ton of good stuff in it, but the way that stuff is organized and structured leaves a lot to be desired, especially the story. It starts promising, pretty much like every other Battle Network game. Evil person breaks internet thing, go fix it. So what happened? I thought about it for a while, and I think I pinpointed the exact moment where things start going downhill for me. Battle Network 6 pops the handbrake after the Skytown disaster, and then sputters along until we visit the expo near the conclusion. There are no major dungeons or levels 
after the weather comp. The game just spins its wheels while hammering out another three or four scenarios that could have been placed anywhere. Hell, that should have been placed in between the major chapters, instead of grouping all the dungeons in one section and then all the story beats in a separate section. I played this game twice in less than a year, and off the top of my head, I couldn't tell you what order any of the major events in the second half of the game happened. It's all a huge blur to me. I I'm sure I could if I tried, but I'd have to stop and really think about it. Visiting ACDC Town lasts five minutes before everyone gets kidnapped and we go do repeat bosses in the undernet. We save Mega Man from beasting out for the hundredth time in the underground, which is just a copy of the undernet, by exposing the totally removable nothing of a character that is Mayor Kane. I was actually considering releasing this video without mentioning Kane at all and seeing if anybody would notice. He's that inconsequential. I skipped through so much of it for this video, but if you want a more detailed look at all of the hilarious and inane conversations I ignored in this video and want to hear what I have to say about it, I did stream all of Grigar version and the VODs are available in this playlist. It feels like the entire second half is 80% walls of dialogue boxes. And to top it all off, it ends in a fucking recycled dungeon. I don't know, I just feel like the pacing and interesting setups completely fall away after Skytown. Like, they didn't have enough resources or cartridge space to create enough gameplay to match the length of the story. So instead of trimming the story down, they just kept going anyway? I think my biggest gripe about Battle Network 6 narrative in general is that while the battles feel like the cumulative peak of the series, the rest absolutely does not give any vibes of being the final game until the last 10 minutes. There's barely any returning characters or locations, and the ones who do show up show up very briefly or optionally. The story isn't anything special or overly engaging on its own, with Wily and Barrel's big generic plan playing backseat to this collection of fodder nobodies. I know there's people who love some of these characters, but they get far too much focus in the back end of the game. Hell, speaking of character focus, does anyone else feel like Lan and Mega Man were secondary characters in this game? I don't know if it's just me, but it seems like we just watch other characters develop and do cool, interesting things while the main characters sit and watch. I think they get the hero theme a single time in the entire game, and I had to check to make sure because I couldn't remember. It's the last game. Let the brothers do cool shit. They don't even do full synchro in this one. They sort of beat one of the side beasts, then Colonel and Iris do everything. I wouldn't have minded any of this for just another Battle Network entry, but this was the last one, probably ever, and it doesn't feel like a proper send-off. Which, while I completely understand the reason it wasn't meant to be the final game at first, doesn't change the fact that it is. Though, I suppose endings aren't exactly Mega Man developers' strong suit, and who could blame them? It's not like they have any experience. Even if Capcom hasn't made a Mega Man subseries game in decades, they always leave themselves open for more entries in that series, but not Battle Network. It's like the Capcom bean counters and shareholders had given up hope on the series thanks to declining sales and franchise fatigue that they themselves caused by oversaturation of mediocre products, and in their panic wanted to just toss it under the rug and replace it with something new to try a fresh start. You know, for the longest time I wondered how I would end this video. How I would close out this weird part of my existence where a stupid Game Boy Advance game changed my entire life. Some long, saccharine diatribe about how much things have changed since I started this Battle Network thing. Some grand send-off. But I thought about it for a while, and I decided not to. I guess that makes me guilty of what I was just complaining about with the ending, huh? I don't think we have to treat this any differently than the end of any other video. Hell, we're not even done with Battle Network, really. We still have the post-games and the spin-offs to cover eventually. I'd also like to make some kind of final ranking video where I can talk about which games I like more than the others and compare and contrast them. I guess what I'm saying is there's no need to conclude things and say goodbye because we're not done yet. We might take a break from Mega Man for a little bit, and I don't know when or what form future projects will take, but... <laughs> I still have plenty of work to do. So for now, I won't say goodbye. I just want to say... If you ask me about Star Force, I will slit your fucking...